reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 to 21. Love in action. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be hope, joyful in hope. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them and do not curse. Rejoice with those who mourn. With those, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. On doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but come overcome every evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Reading from Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 7. When Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humility, then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the gospel of the Lord. What we know not teach us, what we have not give us, what we are not make us for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, the name Will Gidara was not one that I knew. However, for no reason connected to this sermon, I found myself listening to a podcast in which he talked about his journey to create the number one restaurant in the world, 11 Madison Park, which has, wait for it, three Michelin stars and four stars from the New York Times. How did he do it? Largely through an obsession with detail which enabled him to notice everything that he and those working with him could do to make their customers' experience a near-perfect one. 
I was struck, for instance, by a very simple thing they did, which was to learn their customers' names, so that when the customer returned, the staff were able to greet them by their name. Ghidorah calls this approach unreasonable hospitality, which in fact is the name of a book he has written on the subject. Unreasonable because it goes well beyond the level of hospitality that might normally be expected uh, by those who are dining out. Ghidorah reckons that such an approach makes good business sense. But actually, as I listened to the podcast, it struck me there is something deeply Christian about it as well, and therefore much that we in the church would do well to learn from. Well, this morning we come to the third in our series of six sermons based on the Church Urban Funds course called Growing Good, which is intended to help churches explore the connection between social action, discipleship, and growth. Our theme this morning is hospitality, building a culture of giving and receiving, openness and welcome. So a definition or two at this stage may be helpful. Nicole Starling suggests, hospitality is about being other person-centered. It is not about showing off how well you can cook or how beautiful your house is. It's about welcoming people and meeting their needs above your own. One of the contributors to the short film we're going to watch in a few minutes says, I think hospitality is really the business of making people feel at home, feel welcome, feel important, and respected. In fact, that did remind me of that other well-known definition of hospitality. Hospitality is the art of making people feel at home when you wish they were at home. <laughs> Interestingly, and I didn't know this as I began, until I began to prepare for today. The etymology of the word hospitality means giving power to the stranger. And I think that's quite helpful because it reminds us that there is a risk in offering hospitality. For in doing so, we make ourselves vulnerable. Many of you will know the story of Les Miserables. Like me, you may have seen the musical more than once or watched the film or read the book. The story begins in 1815 as the lead character, Jean Valjean, is released from 19 years of imprisonment. However, because his yellow passport marks him out as a former convict, he finds it virtually impossible to find somewhere to sleep. However, a benevolent bishop treats him with kindness and invites him to stay. Tragically, however, Jean Valjean replay, repays the bishop's kindness by stealing his silverware. Adam Weymouth, in an article in, entitled The Vanishing Hitchhiker, quotes the work of Jacques Derrida, who suggests that true hospitality is having your door open any time to anyone, to the other, and giving them whatever they ask for. The reader feasibly overstates his case. After all, even the most hospitable of people might argue that there need to be some common sense safeguards. However, even if he does overstate his case, he does so to make a point. The point being that without some risk, we cannot offer real hospitality. So indeed, there is a risk in offering hospitality and it can be costly. Many years ago, when Jim Thompson was Bishop of Bath and Wells, he told of a visit to Namibia when he met with the Archdeacon of Obidu. Arriving in the middle of a five-year drought, the bishop was offered a shower. We had a shower and watched the water go down the drain, recalled Bishop Jim. We then asked our host how he had acquired all the water. He told us that for six months, they had been saving it for our visit. Risk and cost. And yet there is a clear instruction in Scripture that if we are Christians, 
we must take the offering of hospitality seriously. Our first Bible reading today came from Romans chapter 12. It contains a long list of what love in action should look like. One of those is hospitality. Here's verse 13 again. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. As we all know, it's very easy to talk about loving people. Of course it is. Any of us can do that. But hospitality shows that we mean it. How then might we practice good hospitality? I'm thinking here that there is both a corporate and individual dimension to that question. In other words, there is what we might offer as a church together, and there is what we might offer individually as those who comprise the church. Let's start with the corporate. So here's that film I mentioned just now. It's about six minutes. Another in the series from the church, Urban Fund. So if I'd been involved in Bridges since 91, and there were three of us who had this idea to form a cafe here where we could show God's love in action. And we were trying to think of a name, Bridges, because it will bridge all the community, the, you know, every time economically, socially, educationally. Coming to Bridges, we trust that the people who come and who um, enjoy a coffee with us or a chat, that they have a sense of belonging. And also uh, connecting, because a lot of the people who use us obviously come from the community. And so they connect with our volunteers and enjoy being here. And I just think that an act of kindness goes a long way. It looks like a cafe superficially, uh, but the purpose is to enable people to meet and therefore we try and introduce people to each other um, starting by introducing ourselves as and when um, time allows in between cooking and serving. For me Bridges, I, I would term it really um, as church in the community. People who might not go to um, a church, they can come here and they can see that um, you know the values that we operate by so it's a it's, it's channel, if you like, for uh, God's love. It's about giving it away to others. Now I usually come on a Friday afternoon to help with Place of Welcome. Um, I find that's really lovely because I can just listen to what people say. People tend to open up, either if, you're, if they're eating or if they're doing some sort of handcraft with you. And that's what I really enjoy doing. Quite often we sit and chat for a while and we have cups of tea and cake and um, sometimes we have keep fit, um, sometimes we do craft things and sometimes we have a speaker. Being here makes me feel that I have a purpose and that I can use some of my skills and creativity and at the same time perhaps let people unburden things that are worrying them. For me, um, Bridges is church in the community. We have a verse hanging on, on the wall here in Bridges and it's Matthew 11 verse, verse 28 where the Lord says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I would love to think that our churches are, are places where uh, people are welcome, that they do belong and because of that they have a desire to participate in all the, the activities, if you like, of a church. I think hospitality is really the business of making people feel at home feel welcome, feel important and respected. Just valuing each individual and um, being here for them and being a bridge, if you like, between you know, what is and what you know, sort of the, they would choose to be so that we can walk with them and, and, uh, and journey through life. In the Gospels, Jesus spends a lot of his time eating and drinking in other people's homes. He also welcomes his people to share a meal with him around a table. 
hospitality is at the heart of the Christian faith. The Growing Good research found that churches with a strong culture of hospitality are more likely to grow, both in numbers and in maturity. And hospitality goes further than just offering food. Eating together opens us up to deeper relationships community cafes, coffee mornings, or bring and share meals create opportunities for listening and conversation and friendship. Hospitality is also an opportunity for people to see who you are and for you to see who they are. In the research, we learn from churches who share their faith as well as their food. Some churches offer prayer to individuals who come to the food bank. Others include a short, informal reflection about Jesus during a community meal. And some preach about hospitality on Sunday mornings, knowing that people who use and volunteer at the food bank are listening in. Growing churches do all this with authenticity and respect and generosity. It's also important to let others host you, rather than assuming that we as the church should always be the host. Remember that Jesus spent much of his time as a guest in other people's homes rather than always expecting people to come to him. Giving and receiving hospitality is part of following in the footsteps of Jesus. Over to you. How can your church give and receive hospitality in a way that strengthens relationships. Well, I wonder what struck you in that film. One of the things that struck me was how Bridges, although superficially looking like any other coffee shop, is seeking to do much more than offer food and drink. It is wanting to help people connect and belong. As one of the contributors says, hospitality goes further than just offering food. And you may recall that research which was referred to in the film, Growing Good, Growth, Social Action and Discipleship in the Church of England found that there is a profound difference between feeding someone and eating with them the exchange of a food parcel, for example, does not innately welcome a person into the life of the church, nor does it innately deepen the faith of the volunteer. So here then is the challenge to the church. Good hospitality is more than simply thrusting a cup of coffee at someone and saying, there you go, get on with it. It is befriending them. It is listening to them. It is understanding something of their story. And the Church Urban Fund material offers some helpful questions for us to ask ourselves as churches. Where and how does your church offer hospitality to others? Who is involved in each of these? Who is welcome? What does your church do well? What does it do not so well? Are there any groups within your community which are particularly good at showing hospitality what can you learn from them? How can you share something of your faith in the ways you practice hospitality? Well, I'm pleased to say that here at St. Nicholas, we offer good hospitality in all sorts of ways. I think, for instance, of coffee on Tuesday and Thursday, or our involvement in the meeting place on Saturday and other days. And of course, there are the refreshments we offer on a Sunday when at our best, we use the opportunity to get alongside the stranger, the newcomer, and the person simply longing for a greater depth of relationship. In other words, staying for coffee after church on Sundays isn't just about what we get out of it, but what we can give to others. That said, perhaps there is more that we might consider doing in this regard. Yes, I know that our Resources are not infinite, but we need to remain alert to how the Lord may be prompting us
to grow in this all-important ministry of hospitality. Not only is this a loving thing to do, but it is likely to lead to growth as well. To quote once again one of the contributors to that short film, the growing good research found that churches with a strong culture of hospitality are more likely to grow both in numbers and in maturity. Well, let's move on then to uh, individual hospitality, all too briefly. Our gospel reading this morning, Luke chapter 14, verses 7 to 14, is a good place to start. Here, Jesus outlines two principles of hospitality. First, whether you are a guest or a host, don't always grab the best seat or place for yourself. Rather, be ready to leave it for someone else. I know the temptation, but who wants to be at the end of the table when you can be in the middle, right at the center, connecting with as many people as possible? And yet, good hospitality will sometimes necessitate giving way to others letting others sit where we would rather sit. And the second principle, when you are thinking about who to invite round for coffee or biscuits, or even lunch or dinner, don't simply think about those who you like, and those whose company you find congenial, or those who you sense may return the favor one day. But invite to those who you find difficult and disagreeable, and those who may not be in a position to invite you back. This, I suggest, is challenging stuff. Of course it is. For which of us wouldn't rather have people round for coffee or dinner? Those whose company we like and who make us laugh. But there it is, teaching from the mouth of Jesus. I should say, by the way, if there is a sudden flurry of invitations my way after this sermon. I won't know whether to be happy or sad. Happy because you've listened to what I said, or sad because you think, oh, let's invite someone who's difficult and disagreeable. But um, time has gone, and I will conclude. What I've discovered for myself as I've prepared for today is that I had much more to say about hospitality than I realized. May we take the theme of hospitality seriously, Forgiving and receiving hospitality is very much part and parcel of what it means to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. To end, here again is Nicole Starling, who I quoted earlier. The God who has saved us and welcomed us in Christ is a gracious, hospitable God. For us, his children and servants, hospitality is not an optional extra like icing on the Christian cake. It is one of the attitudes and practices that lie at the heart of a life transformed by the gospel. Amen. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for all your gifts to us. Yet we come to you asking for your forgiveness for the wrong things which happen so frequently, often as a result of man's inhumanity to man. We think especially today of the migrant crisis and the appalling event which took place just days ago, resulting in the loss of so many lives in the Mediterranean Sea when the boat carrying hundreds of, of migrants capsized. Lord, we think of them, of their families and their friends, and ask you to give comfort to all whose lives have been affected by this terrible tragedy in any way. Similarly, loving Father, we remember Barnaby, Grace and Ian, who lost their lives so unnecessarily this week. We pray for their families and friends, for their fellow students at Nottingham University, and all those people 
who lived or worked alongside them. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray today for the Bible Society as it works so hard to spread your word throughout the world. We give you thanks for Susie and Alan Jenkins, our parish links. Thank you, Lord, for this year's Bike for Bibles. Please bless everyone who takes part in this adventure. Keep them safe and fill them with energy and enthusiasm for what they are doing. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for this village of Bookham where we live and give you grateful thanks for Bookham Village Day yesterday. Lord, thank you for the spirit of togetherness which pertained. Thank you for all the families and young children in our community who took part and for the good time which everyone had as they participated in the various activities. In our cycle of prayer, we remember before you everyone who lives in Blackthorn Road, asking that they are good neighbours to one another, always ensuring that no one is neglected or lonely. Please, Lord, make us sensitive to the needs of others and to be aware of what is going on around us. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, please be with Neil MacDonald as he leads the church development plan's focus on maximizing the value of the changes made to our church building so that it may be used to the full. Please bless the various events due to take place here during the coming weeks, that they may be well supported and open up the church to many people who do not regularly worship here. We pray that all are encouraged to become more involved because of the warmth of the welcome they receive. We pray today for our pastoral assistants and for all they do in the parish and in the community. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for anyone known to us who is unwell at this time, holding them up to you in our hearts. From our church family, we pray for Eldred Clark, Tim Collier, Catherine Jobson, Nigel Fenner, Tim Reader, Jenny Carlier, Beryl Wood, Joan Hatcher, Sylvia Charles, Valerie Lambert, and Alison and Ruth Langford. Please give each one of them courage in adversity and help them to feel that, they, that you are close to them at all times. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we remember before you Valerie Good, giving thanks for her life and for all that she did. We pray for her family and friends, asking that they may be comforted in their loss and in the knowledge that they are not alone. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.